Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's great to see our skydiver mountain man back. Great having you back home, Ray. <laughs> Been up in the mountains. Been chasing those goats and all that stuff up there. <laughs> up there just staying cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just as hot? Well, you're closer to the sun, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I just, uh, before we get started here, I just, want, I just found some great news out this week. The, the World Economic Forum that meets every year in Davos, they call us a cult. Hallelujah. I'll wear that badge. There's three criteria. I, I, I boiled it down to it's PHP. Prayer by speaking in tongues. You're a cult. Uh, divine healing. Believing in divine healing. And believe in God's prosperity. Provision. Those three things, we are a cult. And I will wear that badge proudly. God is with us. And uh, so the enemy uh, doesn't, doesn't like it. So if you wait long enough, the enemy will tell you exactly what you're doing right. And God is moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's moving in our, this time supernaturally. And they don't like, the enemy does not like supernatural. So we'll just put a big badge on them and call them a cult. And, and everybody... Praise God, I'm going to wear that badge proudly. Because it's Jesus Christ that we're, we're in love with. And, uh, you know, if you're, not do, if you're not being mocked by the enemy, you're, are you really doing anything? And so, we, because we're a threat. And when we become a threat, they're going to try to humanize you. They're going to throw things at you and all stuff. So, hallelujah. It's, uh, it's a, great, a great day. So I thank you all for coming for the, the potluck today, but actually today we're going to be celebrating Shirley and Mai's anniversary tomorrow. I just, I'm just throwing that in for good measure. 47 years. Yeah. Who? Jerry. So you're 47 tomorrow? <laughs> All right, well, we got a lot to celebrate. The kingdom of God is in the house, and God is moving, and I'm excited about all that God's doing, so it's cool. You know, and uh, I get so amazed with God. So, uh, you know, it's, this week, as I was, okay, Lord, what do you want me to share about? And so, He uh, gave me this, what I'm going to share with us today, and when you see the title of this, it kind of goes with what we're doing today, having potluck. You put the title up, that, that TV's off back there. So it's relational evangelism, or relational Christianity. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Because of what we've been talking about, and I just, I asked the Lord, you know, what's the next step? Next step. And it's like, every, it's always God is taking me to the next step. And and he's taken us, and he wants us to understand who we really are. What's, what's really happening? And because uh, last week we talked about in his presence, the importance of being in his presence. And if you didn't hear that, you know, go back. It's, it's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. It's on, uh, it's on, uh, it's on our website and stuff. So uh, it's... In his presence, the importance of being in his presence. We come together to be in his presence together. I can, at home, I can spend time in prayer and be in his presence. We have to be in his presence and abide in his presence. I never want to leave his presence. That his presence always is with us wherever we go, whatever we do, if I'm on the job or I'm here or there. Now, that's why, unless God called me, 
which he has at times to go into a tavern. I won't go into a tavern because I, I don't want to take God's presence into a tavern. But if he calls me, if he calls me to go in and to minister to somebody, I'm not afraid to go into a tavern or some place that's, that's, that I would not just go in to socialize. But if, if there's God called me to go in and socialize with somebody in there or to talk with somebody, I would do it because why? His presence would go with me. But just for me to, to feel good or to whatever, I don't want to take the Holy Spirit into places like that unless you're called to do something like that. So in His presence, so we're uh, putting on Christ and abiding in Jesus. I put on Christ. I want to be an emulation to the world of Christ. I'm not Christ, but he, the Christ is in me. He is in us. Uh, why do we need to put on Christ? Because till Jesus comes back, we are the only Jesus the world will ever see. We are the expression of Jesus to the world. So how important is that, that I, I want to walk as Jesus walked and emulate my, my Lord that I love? Uh, what is the world seeing in the church today? As the world at whole, looking at the church, what do they see generally? Do they see religious institutions? Uh, do they see Christ in church? Do they see social activity? All those things are good, but in them do they see Christ? Do they see Jesus? Religious bigotry, I think a lot of people look from the world, see, look into the church, and they, they just see religious bigotry bigotry that we are in a the church is in a state of unless you do what we tell you to do or live by what we tell you to do which is the spirit of the pharisees and so the pharisees the religious institution of of jesus day rejected jesus because he didn't fit their bigotry and so people churches there are churches and, and believers that unless you measure up to what we see as what a Christian should be, I reject you. And that's what the world sees because you don't go to church every Sunday if you don't pray, if you don't do this and you don't do that and put all of these things out there. There's, you know, if you don't observe the Sabbath, you know, if you don't do this or you don't do that, you don't measure up. And so people feel white. I'm not, that's bigotry. I'm not going to be a part of it. I don't want to participate in it. So is that really what the church is supposed to be? Or are we supposed to be a family of believers that have the heart of Jesus in them? See, religious bigotry rejected Jesus. So if I'm trying to fit into the religious bigotry of the world then I am becoming like the religious bigotry of the world and not like Jesus. I want the world to reject me. I want Davos to reject me. Because that becomes a badge of honor for us that we are emulating Christ to the world and they don't want that. They're going to reject that. Relational Christianity is going deeper with Jesus, building stronger relationships with our brothers and sisters, and reaching into the world to bring others into the family. Building relationships with one another so that we can, other can reach in and pull others into us. That we can reach into the world and touch others and bring. Why did God... Make us. God created us for, anybody know? Relationship. He wanted to have relationship with us. He's our Father. We're His children. He wanted to have an interaction relationship with Him. That's why He created us. He is not just someone or something to believe in. God is not just this and 
ambiguous thing out there somewhere that we... Yeah, I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, what does that mean to you that you believe in Jesus? Does that... Yeah, I, I believe the sun's going to come up tomorrow. You know, I, 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 there's a lot of things I believe in. But just is it just believing in something? Or is it... Is, uh, I believe in marriage. So 47 years ago, I married Shirley. But it's more than just belief. It's a relationship. And through that relationship of our lives coming together, the, through the hard times, the easy times, the fun times, the sad times, all of those times you go through in life, and through that relationship comes our offspring, our, our sons, uh, we're not blessed with daughters, but we're blessed with some great daughter-in-laws. And our grandchildren and all that stuff is because of relationship, which is the family of God is relationship that we are functioning as a body, as a family coming together, that we be trolled to Christ, that one day He's going to come back and get us. And we, we talked about that a while back. So in this relationship, and so... In this relationship, we are bringing in offspring to Jesus through this relationship that we have with Him. The relational uh, relationship that we have with, with our Lord. Why does God want us to have close association with Him? Because God is love, and love is a reciprocal act. Where God loves us, and we love Him back. It's an exchange. As Shirley and I have that relationship, love, we're love going back and forth to each other. It is, is intimacy of relationship. And so as God loves us, we love Him back. We give Him our whole heart. We give Him our whole soul. We give Him our life. Lord, my life is Yours. I am here for You, Lord. Whatever You want me to do. And You've heard many of the stories of how God has led us through our life. Because God is love and love is reciprocal. Where God loves us and we love Him back. So with the Holy Spirit living in us, we are here to show and express Christ's love to the world. That's why we're here. Because if we're not here for that, beam me up, Scotty. If we're not here to reach the world and bring the world into this relationship, into this family, we're just spinning wheels. I'm ready. Get me out of here. But if there's a purpose... If it's to reach my children and my grandchildren and my neighbor, my friends, my co-workers, everybody around me that you bring into my life, Lord, I want to love them and bring them into the family. Mark 12, 29-31, Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. What's left? Everything in your being should be loving the Lord. Let's do it again. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Everything about you should be about loving the Lord. Yeah, I go to church once every six months. Yeah, I, I love God. What kind of a relationship would you have between a husband and wife? Yeah, we get together once every couple, three weeks. Is that love? Or love means you want to be together. You want to cohabitate together. You want to have intimacy together. You want to share feelings and emotions. And... A lot of my prayers is, Lord, help me understand this, or lead me, how do you want me to go this way, or Lord, forgive me for 
what I have said or what I have done. Or, Lord, I want my heart right. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. I never want to be in that place that the Holy Spirit is backs away. That God wants to back away from my life because I am rejecting Him. And it says, these things we just said, this is the first commandment. Not ten, this is the first one. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Two. We don't have ten, we have two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Do you love your neighbor, those around you, like you love yourself? Loving God and loving people is the two commandments Jesus gave us to follow. American society is, is deeply fractured. As I want to belong. People in our culture and the world want to belong to something. Won't someone love me, value me, and accept me? How many people out there have been raised in families and homes that mom and dad so busy, they have no interaction, no relationship, and so what happens to find that and to fulfill that void in their life, what do they look for? Gangs, a boyfriend, girlfriend, somewhere out in the culture, instead of a wholesome family relationship, they're looking for it out there. Because we're all created for that to have relationship. We need relationships. We're not be to be by ourselves. There's fractured families all over the place, all, all over our culture, fractured families. Adult, adults going from one broken relationship to another. People of all ages are longing, are, are lonely, isolated, and distressed. People have an inborn desire to have significance, to be valued, to be significant. God created all people to have meaningful relationships with Him and with other human beings in relationship with Him. We see all over the place youth gangs, children that don't have any relationship at home. They're looking for something to be significant, so they join a gang. Adults frequently in bars, and some of us older people know where everybody knows your name. The show that used to be on years ago, that was their theme song. You go to the bar so everybody knows your name there, but nobody else does. That's why people fall victims to bizarre cult leaders. Like Jim Jones. If you remember Jim Jones that took 800 some people down into South America and they all drank the Kool-Aid. They all died. Because they wanted to be significant. Our adversary, the devil, is glad to provide a counterfeit place for you to belong. He wants you to belong somewhere, and he will provide a place for it. So unless the church shines its light, and people are drawn to the church, to the body of Christ, what are they going to be drawn to? The world. We humans will go to unbelievable links to connect and belong somewhere. Somewhere. So the church family, it is, it is sad. In many respects, the church has been a lot like the world. Not a place where you can feel safe, but feel judged and condemned. Lady, you can't come in here like that. 
How if any of you heard Jeff Finholt, who is Jesus Christ superstar star years and years ago, 13 years old, sat on the back row of the church. When the altar call came, he come forward to get saved. 13 years old. Come up, and the preacher said, Young man, tell you, cut your hair, you're not worthy to be saved. He went out into Black Sabbath, Jesus Christ, he, drugs, all that. Eventually, God did get him. His blood was on that pastor. His soul was, he would give account for that soul because he rejected a young man who was coming for love and acceptance and he got bigotry because his hair was too long. That is why you get, this, this is what you get when, you, when the church is a religious organization and not the body of Christ. How much of the church in the world is a religious organization and not the body of Christ? The church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, or a meeting of the called out. We are the ecclesia. We are called out. We have been called out from the world. We have called out together. We individually are the ecclesia, the called out. And we as a body are the called out. A meeting, coming together and meeting together. The church is supposed to be the one that, <clears throat> that have been called out from the world and have been separating themselves from the world to the Lord. The church is to be a mirror of Christ and not the world. People should see, I see Jesus in you. That's the greatest accomplishment we can receive is I see Jesus in you. I feel Jesus in you. That's who we are. We're the ecclesia. We have been called out. We, the Christian church, are to be Christ-like the church family. The church should be a healing community of believers Helping one another along the road of life. A people who live in an environment that flows with love and healing. Love and healing. To receive love, a person must first feel safe. If a person does not feel safe, they will not receive love. And sometimes with people that are so broken... You have to spend time with them and build up trust with them. And building that trust takes time. If they've been abused and all kinds of things and manipulated and controlled, all this, they think you're just somebody else that wants to control them. But it takes time and intimacy with them. Building that relationship in them so they will begin to feel the love that you have for them. Well, I don't have the time to do that. Well, how valuable is a soul? How valuable is someone? To receive love, a person must feel safe. Healing is shown in three areas. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness. 1 Corinthians 13, 1-3 Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, I have become sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have the faith, I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I... Give my bodies to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. I don't care what we do out there. If you don't have love in your heart for people, you're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. It's about love. It's not about all the religious things that we can do. Go down in the park and we get 500 people saved and someone comes up to you and and ask you for help, and uh, 
you're beneath me. You don't have love. You're doing it for your own glory. God will use, he'll use an ass to get his truth out. He will use somebody who's corrupt to touch somebody else's life. So just because God is using you, doesn't mean you have it. But you just might be that, that mule that God is going to use to get to that person over there because that person wants it and you're rejecting him and you think you're somebody. So how many preachers are in pulpit are doing it for their own glory and looking at how great I can be and look at what I'm doing. I've got this, what he says, I can move mountains. I can do all these great things. But if you're not doing it because you love the people, you're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. This love Paul is talking about is agape love. One, practicing agape love. Agape love is unconditional love that you cannot earn. You can't love enough to get it. It's bestowed upon you by the Holy Spirit. You make yourself, Lord, fill me with your love, that I might touch others. Use me, Lord. Agape love is what Christ demonstrated while on the earth. The religious institutions put him on the cross. The religious people were fighting everything to destroy him. The devil entered into the religious institution. But he loved people anyway. And he was willing to go to the cross and die for those people. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. His agape love. He commanded his followers to practice this kind of love. Agape love is primarily an act of the will, not the emotions. It's not, oh, I feel love. It is, I love you. Even though I might have reservations, or I might have fear, or I might have things going on in a situation. It's like I just heard this other day, this, his, his man was sharing... His daughter was so moved that she wanted to take this medicine or something to a, a country where children were dying. But she went and talked to her dad, and her dad is against the vaccines. And she said, Dad, I've got to take 75 vaccines to go. And he said, Honey, what do you want to do? And she says, I want to go and minister to those children, I'm going to take it. She was willing to lay her life down. But I believe because of her heart, God will be with her. And well, though I die, I want to fulfill the purposes that God has to touch people. She was motivated by love. Willing to lay her own life down. He commanded his followers to practice this kind of love. Agape love is primarily the act of the will, not the emotions. A definition of agape love is always and under all circumstances seeking the other purpose, the other person's highest good at whatever personal sacrifice may be involved. I love you so much I am willing to lay my life down for you. Because I know where I'm going. But I want you to get there also. That's Jesus' love. I will lay my life down for you so that I can have you in, with me in heaven. That's agape love. Ephesians 5, 1, 1, and, 3, 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has walked 
has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. In John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. How? As I have loved you. As I have loved you. So who are we to imitate? Jesus. That's how we are to love one another. And love the world. As I have loved you. Uh, that you that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. This does not mean that we are to walk on or, ab or be abused. It's not saying, okay, I love you so much, you can do whatever you want to me. That's not what it's saying. It does not mean that that we are willing to, it does mean that we are willing to exercise tough love within certain relationships. Oh, if you love me, you'll give me this. No, if I love you, I won't give you to that. There's a tough love of standing up what is good. I'm looking out for your best interest. Because I love you. And I don't want to see this, what you're going to do, will destroy you. So I will not feed into that. You do it, that's up to you. But I am not going to participate in it. And I'm telling you, don't do it. That's tough love. But some think that, oh, when we love, we just, we're gushy love and we just give. No, that's not what it is. We do not have agape love in ourselves. Agape is supernatural. We are deeply dependent on the Holy Spirit to give us this love. This love flows to us to flow through us to others. So walking in this kind of love really means that I have to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit and interacting with the Holy Spirit. And when something is expected of me or somebody's asking something of me or in that situation, I go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? Give me wisdom in this, Holy Spirit. I want to help them but I don't want to help them if it destroys them, hurts them, or anything else. I want to do, Holy Spirit, what you want. See, this is, we're not left out there all by ourselves to make up our own mind. We have the Holy Spirit right here. And we have the Holy Spirit to get, 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 get counsel, get guidance on what to do. Holy Spirit, how do I reach this person? And he might give you something that seems like, well, that, that doesn't seem like much, but that might be the one thing that will trigger that person. And so you do something and say, I, I love my mom and she used to always do this for me. Who knew? Holy Spirit knew exactly what she needed or he needed at that moment in time. So that's why it's just, that we're, the, the, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit as we're flowing in this agape love, because it's not our love, it's His love. And Lord, I want to be a vessel for You to flow through me to other people. We are deeply dependent on the Holy Spirit to give us this love. This love flows to us to flow through to others. Number two, accepting one another. A healing church will be characterized by people who are accepting of one another. A definition of acceptance is releasing another from the need to qualify or perform for my love and attention because I value and accept you. You don't have to do anything to receive my love. 
I want to love you. I want to give you love. It's not a qualifier. How many times raising children do you want to throw them out in the morning garbage? Because you're just, I'm so tired of this stuff, but I love you. Holy Spirit, help me with this, this son of mine or this daughter or help me in this situation to love them. And you walk with them through whatever it is. And at the end, you have this huggy, crying time together and stuff. So which one did I do? Did I, I do the, both of those? Okay, next one is Romans fifteen seven. Accept one another, then just as Christ accept you in order to bring praise to God. <coughs> Accepting you does not mean that we will necessarily agree with your views or your lifestyle. I accept this person who is broken, but I don't like your lifestyle. But I still love you, and I still care for you. With your working with somebody who's coming out of drugs, or they're, and they're having a hard time coming out of that, or prostitution, or who, who knows, broken relationships, all this kind of stuff. They do stupid stuff. But it takes time with the Holy Spirit, and you right there with them, helping them, coaching them through this, to bring them out of that, that they were buried in. I don't accept what they're doing, but I'm not going to reject them for what they're doing. I love them, and I want to bring them up out of that. Uh, where am I? I'm totally lost here. Oh. Titles we put on people can be devastating to an individual like, you're an alcoholic, you're a drug addict, you're a prostitute, you're a failure. When you're working with people, don't throw names out. You were. You were. You don't want to keep burying them under that. You bring them out of that. In contrast, these are precious people whom God loves who are caught in destructive behavior. We must separate the individual which has great value from the destructive behavior. We define the behavior, the person. I'm working on the person. We're going to overcome the behavior. And so it takes time. It takes time. People can sense what we think about them. I can say it, but if I think the opposite, they will pick up on it. You reject me. No, no, I, I, I love you. No, you reject me. They can sense the Spirit. The motive of your heart will reveal that you do genuinely care. The caring, <coughs> caring will come in the love of Christ with compassion for them. Your heart will be revealed if you look down on them because they are beneath you. That's what a lot of religion projects, that people are beneath them because you don't measure up to our standard. Never forget where you came from. All of us were broken. All of us. We must always remember, except for the grace of God, there go I. Amen. Number three, forgiving one another. A healing church will be characterized by people who are forgiving one another. Untold millions of Christians are imprisoned in unforgiveness. The sin has the very serious and destructive nature. Matthew 6, 14. 
For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Oh, I can't forgive them for what they did. I'll never be able to forgive them. What have you just said? Heavenly Father says, well, then I can't forgive you. Not a good place to be. Not a good place to be. I must relinquish my desire to punish or see them punished. Because you did this to me, I'm going to destroy you. Is that God's heart? God says, you put my son on the cross, I'm going to destroy you all. Forgiveness is not justification. Forgiveness is letting go. You let it go. If we do not, it has serious consequences in you. When we are not forgiven, we we experience guilt. Guilt prevents us in expressing faith towards God so that we feel hopeless and separated from Him. You begin to walk in unforgiveness, you will feel a separation from God. Because God has to back up. I can't bless what you're doing. I love you, but I want you to come out of it. A forgiving church is one that knows they will, <clears throat> that they will be hurt by people. If we forgive people, people will mock us, throw stones at us. Because the devil doesn't want us to forgive. That's the, tab- the tool that he uses. He locks us up in unforgiveness. But our will to believe God for a loving outcome is what we need to believe God and press in. We have to press into God. And a lot of this this stuff I'm talking about here needs some knee time. Your prayer time. To work through some of this. Because some of these things can really, really be tough. And without the presence of the Holy Spirit, oh yeah, we can, we can. I'm telling you, some of this stuff can really be tough. And you have an adversary that adversary that wants to take you out, so that you do not become effective. And he wants you to lack on by emotions and all these things, to lock on to these unforgiveness and stuff. What what they did. Again, what someone does to you, and you forgive them, you not just you did not justify. See, forgiveness is not about them. Forgiveness is about you. See, if I say, I forgive you, if I forgive Tom for what he did. Now, he ran into my car and he ran away. That jerk. So I say, Tom, I forgive you. But in my heart, I didn't forgive him. Or do I say, I don't understand what happened there, Tom, but I release you. I'm doing it not for Tom's benefit, but for my benefit. Because I don't want to harbor that that place that the enemy can come in now and can begin to torment my heart and come in to infiltrate me and bring bitterness into my heart, that I become more bitter towards Tom and, and somebody else that's a jerk. And, you know, that's how the devil works. And so it's, it's letting go. Now, Tom's not a jerk. He's a great guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he may not want to sit in the front row anymore. Without the Holy Spirit in our lives, this is, this is crucial, crucial. Without the Holy Spirit in our lives and our church, we cannot love, accept, or forgive. We have to have the Holy Spirit in our church, in our lives. <clears throat> 
we will fail without the Holy Spirit working through us every day. A safe place for the hurting, I should say the safest place for hurting to heal is the Christ-like church. The safest place should be coming to church. But how many people, when they're really hurting, don't want to go to church because they don't want to be condemned? They don't want to be looked down on. They won't, don't want to... What? Because the enemy will lie. Lie to keep people away. What they actually need is the body of Christ. The church community that practices biblical love, acceptance, and forgiveness is the place where the hurt can find a place to be healed. We want people who are broken. Because we are broken. And that we can share with them the love of Christ. We're living in a, a time where there's a lot of broken people out there. And they need the true message of the gospel. The true message of love, of loving people, accepting them. I accept you not for your sin or what you've done or what you've accomplished. I accept you because you are a child of God. And every one of us here and every one of us out there, everyone out in the world is a son and a child of the Most High. And God's heart is that, that none would be lost and that all would be saved. Amen. And He's entrusted us to reach the lost. He's entrusted us to reach the broken. He's trusted us to go out and find them, that one sheep, that one sheep that's broken out there, and bring them in. And show them what the true love of Christ is. Not a religious institution. If, uh, the devil is, has done wonders to getting the, uh, the attitude in the culture of the world that the religious institution is an evil place. Because you'll be condemned. And a lot of churches play right into that. But that's not the church. That's not the body of Christ. I believe what if we, as we walk in this, we are walking in this. I am, I am committed to walk in this. I believe that all of us are walking into it. What, what we will find happen is that the Holy Spirit will begin to bring people to us because He knows we're safe. The Holy Spirit will bring people. Will, people will be touched healed, set free, and delivered. And so, I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm excited who we are. And that the presence of God is abiding with us. And so, now we're going to, I'm going to close here this part, my message. We're going to enter into worship. We're going to do little things a little different today because we have our pot of faith. We don't believe in luck. We believe in faith. And so, what we'll do is Dan's got uh, some, our worship songs. I'll have the, the ministry team to come up come fr- up front here during worship. And if you need prayer, they'll be here to, to pray with you. But we'll do, uh, what do you got, five songs? Somewhere around there. Uh, he'll sing me. I'll come up and I'll, I'll bless the food. And then we will dismiss and go back there. Now, there will be music on. If you need to stay in here, you can, you can stay if the Lord has you here. But <clears throat> what we've had before, trying to figure out how to, how to do this, is if we do like a normal service, people will linger and linger in here, and pretty soon you go back, and people are ready to go home, and there's, we're out of food, or they're, they're trying, uh, you know, we need to just, because this is a time of celebration. The body of the family of God coming together. And so we want to celebrate over a, a meal together. And so we want to close out this time, go to, that, go to there. And uh, we praise the Lord for, for, for all, of, 
all of you. We love all of you. That We appreciate what God is assembling here together. We know there's a lot of people that are out on vacation and all that stuff, and we pray the blessing upon them. But let me, let me uh, pray, and then we'll go into worship. Lord, I, I thank you. Lord, I, I pray the word that I shared today was what your heart was. And Lord, I pray where I didn't get uh, clarity, Lord, you will, Holy Spirit, I pray you will bring the clarity. But Lord, I pray that, Lord, we want to be, we want to emulate you, Jesus, with the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We want to be you, Jesus, and love people and care for people. Lord, I thank you that you are working in our hearts, you're working in our spirits, you're working in our lives. Lord, I thank you that you are working in us. But Lord, we know there's still, we have family members, we have neighbors and relatives and in our community, Lord, that still need you. And so, Lord, I pray anointing upon each one of us. Lord, a fresh anointing of your agape love. Fill us with your love. Fill us with an overflowing presence of your love. Lord, where we haven't seen through your eyes, help us to see through your eyes and see the broken people and see how we can touch people that need you. Lord, we just don't want to be a, a, a church to just, we for no more. We want to touch people. Lord, we want to let our light so shine out into our community. Lord, that people will know that Island View Worship Center is a safe place and that they will love you there and they will help you on your, on your journey. Lord, so we just pray, Lord, let your anointing be upon every person here because every one of us is an evangelist. Every one of us is a, miss, miss, a minister. Every one of us has, that are born again. If, if we don't know you, Lord, right now as we are worshiping, we accept you as our Lord and Savior. But Lord, we want your presence and Holy Spirit to flow, fall fresh on us. Without you, Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. And we thank you, Holy Spirit. So as we enter into this time of worship, we pray, Lord, just fill us with your presence. Fill us with your love, your agape love. And Lord, that we can tear, take it with us into our busy week, this week before us. Lord, just receive our worship now as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 